Well, hello and welcome back, everybody. I'm Dan John from danjohnuniversity.com, and this is the danjohnuniversity.com podcast. Each and every week, I sit down here with my microphone and your questions, and I do my best to answer them. Uh, it's a good week of questions. Uh, this is episode 186. We've been doing this for quite a while now, and I feel like it, it seems to get better and better. And the reason it gets better and better is because of your questions, and I appreciate that. Uh, remember, if you have questions, send them in to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. And again, I'll do my best to answer each and every one. Uh, the first question, <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to say the person's name, but nor am I going to read the question verbatim, uh, because it was an interesting question. The person knows that I used to be a hammer thrower. I was really, I think I was born to be an Olympic hammer thrower. Uh, but, uh, when I was growing up, it was really hard to find the event. Um, it was hard to get it done at track meets because of the, the perceived danger of it. Um, yeah, I mean, if you get hit by a hammer, it's bad, but there's no difference between that and, you know, a lot of other stupid things we do. Uh, the person asked me a question about an article written years ago. It showed up for the first time in Muscle and Fitness magazine, showed up at a bunch of other places, and it was about Yuri Sadiq, the great Soviet hammer thrower, who still has the world record, who I spent many lunches, breakfasts, and dinners with throughout the years, uh... My daughters have plenty of stories about Yuri. Uh, he passed away a couple of years ago. And it's about this person who said that they had the secret of what the Soviets were doing. And the secret was this exercise called the step up. And I one time at lunch asked Yuri about this article and he got visibly angry. He usually never showed emotion. The Soviets hold back pretty well. But in this case, he got angry and he said that this was full of crap. He said no, it was much more vulgar than that. But uh, the person had never been there, never trained. And one of the things, uh, and he even said this, it was, it was absolutely uh, pure candor with me about uh, Coach Bondarchuk. Um, that's, he would say to me all, all the time, you know, these articles, that's not what we did. You know, we did other things. So it was interesting because I pulled up, this is All American Athlete. It's a Weeder magazine um, where actually the original material about Yuri's training came up. This is the April 1965 edition. Uh, on the cover is a hammer thrower, uh, which is interesting. That's Hal Connolly. And inside here, there's an article called You Can Make It. Build tremendous leg power fast with your own leg power box. And basically... It's someone, you, you make a little box and then you step up on it with weight on your back and it becomes the answer to all your questions. And the only reason I even, and I, I'm not even, I'm trying not even to rant or even be mean because it's a good question. But one of the things that happens and it happens a lot in our field is that someone will hear something, see something, and all of a sudden that becomes the new truth. Like you'll watch the world champion train and all they do is singles in the power clean with 140 kilos, uh, 315 pounds. And you say, the secret to being the best shot per in the world is power cleaning 315 pounds for seniors, uh, for, for singles. <laughs> I'm a senior. Uh, now, the problem is, of course, when you find out about that day, you discover that the university they were training at only had bumper plates that went up to 315, 140K, and that's all that the elite track and field athletes had to train with. Then you find out that this athlete was just taking it and doing some singles just to kind of warm up, just to loosen up in the weight room, as a lot of us used to do. Um, lift, You'd lift weights first, and then you go out and throw. I think that's the bulk of my career, actually, um, because it felt good. And this person was just doing it. So you take this one tiny, and I want to say sliver, but it's smaller than a sliver of a person's training, and you extrapolate that into an entire training program and system. Uh, we see this a lot. It's that bugaboo we used to have in the United States. If you put the word Soviet on it, uh, if there was a fungus that grew under a, a flight of stairs, but the Soviets ate it, of course, that was the secret to success. 
uh, when I worked with my friends who were uh, from the Soviet Union, including Yuri, Vasily would be another one. We spent a lot of time. They kept saying, no, that's not what we did. Uh, my friend Vasily, we snatched, we cleaned, we jerked, we front squatted. And what else? Well, then we do it again. And But the thing is, in a local meet, you know, to get on the podium, you had to lift more than those other guys, and they were getting very strong. And so the competition uh, built them up. So this isn't a rant by any means, but I just wanted to start this off. And I'm not sure I always get this off, uh, this kind of stuff off clear enough. That's why I have this thing called the inner circle. And the inner circle, uh, we're opening a new group. Uh, where's the email on that? Uh, pardon me. The, the site is danjohninnercircle.com. Uh, we meet weekly. Uh, I act, we have a WhatsApp account. We talk. Um, most of the people uh, on the inner circle, we, we'll, we'll have extra conversations somewhere out of nowhere about things. But the nice thing about it is if somebody comes and trains with me one day, and I have a funny story, uh, Lyle McDonald, you know, the low carb guy, uh, his, his book, Cyclical Ketogenic Dieting, uh, was the first time I ever read something in a PDF. I had to download Adobe Acrobat because I didn't know how to, I'd never even heard of a PDF before. And uh, Lyle and I are good friends. He's a, yeah, I think he's a great man. Uh, he came over to watch me train one day and I was at the end of a long, long couple of years of training and I kind of circled my weaknesses. And so one of the things I was doing in my off season was I was doing extra leg curls. Well, he came in and he said, I'm so disappointed. And he was joking. I'm so disappointed to see the great Dan John doing leg curls. And we joked because if that's all you saw me do in that eight or nine or 12 year period that I was really at my, my best as an athlete, he saw me have that one workout where I was doing leg curls. I was doing ab work and arm work. It was a deep off season program. And I was working on a few issues of mobility, flexibility, and some muscle groups that I thought had lagged behind, <laughs> you would say that all I do to train is leg curl. Well, basically I leg curl for about two weeks in a 12 year period. If you're in something like the inner circle, you can say something like that and I have a chance to explain it to you. I wish everybody had the opportunity just to sit down sometimes and just ask that great question, what do you mean by that? Now, I use that all the time in, in my field. Like, like the, the old joke is, you know, if you if you have a theology background and you're at a party, someone always say to you, well, I'm very spiritual. And of course, the follow-up, which I learned later on, is what do you mean by that? When someone says they're into training, I used to think that they probably Olympic lifted like me. And then I say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, about every two weeks, I take a walk for about eight minutes. Well, the difference between <laughs> preparing for an Olympic lifting meet and, <laughs> you know, doing an occasional walk or, you know, sauna at a gym is radically different. The nice thing about the inner circle, and it's danjohninnercircle.com if you want to apply for the next group, about only 10 to 15 people are in there because it's, it's got to stay small. We meet, we meet a lot. We talk a lot. But what we do is we get to this question, what do you mean by that? If you say you're a goal-oriented person, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by goal-oriented? And, and, and I like it a lot. I, I think there's value to this. Um, it would be interesting if you're listening. Uh, it, it might be fun to put this in the comments. Uh, what are the kinds of things that you hear uh, in fitness and bodybuilding and training that you want to say, well, wait, what do you mean by that? Uh, and it happens, it happens a lot sometimes. I know it sounds weird. If you've never gone through this mental exercise, it might sound like I'm a lunatic. But if you've done it where you've actually stopped and said, well, these people train, you know, 12 hours a day? And then you, and then you have the follow-up question. What do you mean by that? Oh yeah, they do meditation for two hours. They take a one hour sauna. They get a one hour massage. Oh, okay. So that's included in the training time. A three hour nap is training, you know, all of a sudden things make sense. Um, so if, if you get a chance, if you're interested, danjohninnercircle.com, uh, love to have you. 
And if there are questions that I can answer about what do people mean by this, you know, put a comment in there. And by the way, while you're there, you know, why if it would do me a great favor if you would subscribe to this uh, channel. And the, and the only reason I say that is that um, I get buried a lot by people who are uh, influencers, uh, but and they'll do they'll talk about kettlebells or, or Olympic lifting, and frankly, I'll try not to swear, but they don't know very much. They don't have very much experience. They've never met you know they've never you know Olympic lifted in a meet, or they've never done you know a cert, or they've never trained with good kettlebell people. So there you go. So if you can, you know. Ask, ask good questions here, and if you can, like and subscribe if you can. All right, that was just a little bit of a rant, but uh, I, I, the point I was trying to make, and I don't even want to answer this question truly, is that you got to be very careful, especially now. I used to believe everything I read on the internet. It's true. And now my discernment process is much higher, but, you know, when you read things in magazines, I, as a child, I always took it as true. And now I know much better. So I would say the same about the internet. So let's practice a little bit of discernment when we, when we try new things or hear new things. And let's move on to question number two. Jacob asks a good question. And I think it is a good question. I have a sister who's eight years old. She loves play wrestling with me when I'm at home and with my very limited experience with uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And please, always type up Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for me, okay? Don't just put the initials. I would say that she's actually quite good at it. Since I live about five hours away and can't do that very often, I would like to find a local wrestling or judo team for training one to two times a week. Is there anything else that I should be thinking about? Boy, at eight, as a female, if you could get her to the dojo or whatever they're called in other schools, uh, and get her into judo at that age, two days a week. I did one day a week and I I really knew my stuff. I was, I think I was her age. I might've been a little bit older, but yeah, two days a week in a dojo. The nice thing is about the martial arts is that she'll also learn discipline. She'll also learn uh, like maintenance. Uh, weird, that's a weird thing to say, but you know, cleaning up after yourself, you take your shoes off, you don't just walk across the mat, you don't just, you know, there's the, the, the whole culture of respect. I think that stuff is really valuable and um, you can't emphasize that enough in this day and age. So yeah, if you could find a, a place that she, and I'm not even sure it matters what mar, uh, martial arts she would study, any of them would be pretty good. At eight, Two days a week, I would say, would sneak it up on the maximum. And I'm always thinking about that for just boredom level. Kids get bored fast at that age. In my experience, I could be wrong. Once is great. Twice, if you can make it happen, would be great. But the follow-up's a good question. Another sister of mine, says Jacob, is 14 years old. She's not very athletic, but looking good is very important to her. She has expressed interest in going to the gym. I've been thinking about giving her... Brett, the Brett Contreras book about glute-focused programs and showing her the basic exercises. Again, is there anything else I should be thinking about? First off, yeah, I'm a big fan of glute. Uh, I got it's right there. It's Glute Labs. I, I think it's a great book. I, it's a great book. His earlier book, Strong Curves, might be better. Uh, I still use Strong Curves uh, in our Buns and Guns Day. Um, we do two rounds of hip thrust followed by uh, hip thrust followed by glute loop followed by deficit deadlift followed by ab wheel and that is our our Brett Contreras uh, modified uh, glute workout and then we work upper body in the book glute lab I do think he goes into his magical six exercises which I think are wonderful you know if you can get your uh, female athletes to do uh, chin-ups, deadlift, squat, hip thrust, bench press, and the others, I don't remember them all. I mean, you're going to be pretty good. But what's good about your question, if you don't mind, is that there's an athletics question here and an aesthetics question here. And it's interesting, but in my experience, in my conversations, 
if I can get, uh, in my perfect world, uh, my first uh, client experience would be to take uh, my clients to a division one track and field meet and then just go, just pick the body out that you want. Now, I mean, obviously, I'm joking a little bit, but you'll find that, you know, most of the women are going to be drawn to a, oh, yeah, that's, you know, that's what I want to look and, and I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, I'll agree with you. And there's a, there's a look about elite track and field athletes that I think a lot of people want. So I think I'm trying to make a point here, Jacob, if you're following. Uh, the look comes from the athletic side. The look comes from the training from the athletic side. So when you get into just pure aesthetics, aesthetics, uh, if you can take some cues from uh, track and field and the, the strength sports, I think you'll get some very interesting ideas. So yes, I think the book Strong Curves is brilliant. Uh, so is Blue Glab, sure. But Strong Curves might be a little bit better uh, for just the look. But at the same time, um, Jacob, both your sisters will be able to use the same toolkit to achieve their goals. You know, <laughs> um, you know, I always fall back on the snatch and the clean and jerk, but I certainly have great respect for the, the hip thrust and all the other exercises in, in, in uh, Brett's book. because And, of course, and sprinting and bear crawls and, you know, monkey bars and everything else. Um, so, yeah, I... Uh, I would suggest for both sisters, they can probably train together to get the, to get the benefits, both on the field of play and, you know, just the, 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 you know, look good, feel good, move good aspect of it too. It's a great question, uh, Jacob. <laughs> and I'm always amazed in my career uh, when people ask me what their, when people tell me what their ideal body is and oh so often, it's a, a look that you would find uh, fairly common at a track and field meet. All right. So uh, there you go. And thank you. Uh, we have a question from Marcus. I, I, I feel like I answer a lot of questions from Marcus, but there's probably many on the planet. Would you mind speaking a bit on how you used to learn lifts when you started out and the role of good technique in the old days? Ouch. Marcus, come on. Today, it seems to me, there is a strong current against just going out and doing the lifts until you get them right. People appear so apprehensive to just try something, say a kettlebell snatch and figure it out. Everybody has certs, performance standards, workshops, etc. As if the world would end if you didn't do a lift suboptimally for a little bit. Marcus, you ask a lot of questions if it's the same guy, but I got to tell you something. Uh, the question nails it. You know, I'm amazed at how people are so hesitant to just, you know, like in my case, you know, we pulled out, uh, yeah, I'll just pull this one out. Okay, here's Bodybuilding and Self Defense by Miles Callum, the first book I ever read in this field. And uh, you'll notice that the picture between the press doesn't fully. There's some, there's some moments there, but we were able, you know, me and Kim Richards and Greg Winslow and the Gregory twins, we could, we were smart enough to look at that and go, uh, you know, uh, if the weight starts here and it ends up here, we should, you know, do that. You know, we didn't need uh, doctoral dissertations on how to do a military press. Uh, it's interesting, by the way, that book has the alternating, uh, the alternating seesaw press and the uh, Weeder magazine I showed a few minutes ago has the alternating seesaw press. The other day I was telling somebody, uh, they asked me what my favorite for almost everybody exercise is. And I said, probably the seesaw press and when in doubt, the walking seesaw press. So uh, I think my 1960s brain is still working. And that's the, but it just tied in. I taught myself how to snatch and clean and jerk. Now, Pete Hoffman, the first time he saw me snatch, made fun of me because it looked so terrible. But, you know, I was snatching pretty good weights, you know, before I mastered my technique. I snatched body weight within three weeks of learning how to do the snatch. Um, go online and ask these experts if that's what they could do, you know. Because you get, so many people get so stifled 
by the coaching, they never actually do the lifting. I know people make, I, I read it all the time online, people make fun of the way I, I teach the Olympic lifts, the kettlebell swing, because I try to keep things simple. I'm not trying to keep things simple. I'm trying to keep things simple. I'm not trying to keep things simple. What I'm trying to do is give you permission to try it. You try it, you fix it. You know, I've got grandchildren and you know, the first time they walk, I don't say, oh, you're not doing it right. Let me, I'm a certified walking specialist. Let me show you how to do it. No, you let the little guy walk around. He falls down, he gets up, he falls down, he gets up, he falls down. Pretty soon he stops falling down and he picks it up. That's the way I think you should learn everything. Um, the first time I saw someone rotate in the discus was in a movie that they showed us in a PE class. I'd only seen people do standing throws. Now I'd seen pictures of people doing the rotation, but I'd never seen anyone actually rotate. Um, so I saw this, this, it was a movie, and I think it's Coca-Cola, and I think it's available on YouTube. I've seen it on YouTube. And it had Randy Matson and LJ throwing the discus. I remember that clearly. And I looked at that, and I went out the next day, and I started rotating. And I went from being a 55 foot standing throw, <laughs> which is terrible, to 103 feet in the full turn, probably in two weeks. And I went from being a, a kid who couldn't even make the finals in a ninth grade competition to either winning or taking second in every single event in the next, well, I took a few thirds in the bigger meets, but you know I did really well for the next few years because I tried. I, yeah, get, did I get things wrong? Absolutely. I would love to coach little Danny John the discus. But here's the funny thing. I don't know if I'd be sitting here now if I'd had all that extra clarity and information. Because it is a process and you got to learn. You know, you, you got to learn. And the nice thing is when you try something on your own and you make mistakes and then someone comes along, a Dick Nutmeyer, a Ralph Mom, a... a uh, Bob Lahati and says, oh, do it like this. And there's that moment where you just have that flash of insight and you say, yeah, it's a lot easier that way. So that's how we learned. Um, uh, behind me up there is a whole bunch of magazines called Strength and Health. And I looked at them and I studied them and I tried to figure things out. I would cut out discus throwing pictures from track and field news. You know, I would... Yeah, okay, here's one. Um, this is from the May 1975 Track and Field News. I'm a high school senior, and I look at John Van Reeden throwing the world record. There's no pictures of him throwing, but I'm looking here, and I'm reading this, and I'm looking at this, and I'm going, wow, I can... Uh, there's Gary Ordway a quote in there. There's a Jay Sylvester quote in there. Uh, and I would just mine those articles for information. And every so often, yeah, I would bump into a John Powell and he would show me one or two things. Rarely did I get it right the first 200 times after that. But then after I did, that's my experience. I use the word I and my a lot in there. But that's how most of us used to learn. And Marcus, I appreciate that question because I thought it was really quite good. Thank you. That was a good question. <laughs> It's funny, I've done a lot of historical references in this podcast. The, the person I didn't want to quote because of the article that kind of upset me, um, Marcus, um, I think things were better when you couldn't just, you know, type in on YouTube, you know, discus throwing technique and get 300 videos. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that it's right or wrong. I just think that using the power of your imagination uh, was a game changer. Okay, small small segue right here. And I just, you know, I have a very successful financial career. I, I do very well. And the, one of the reasons I think I do so well is I'm quite creative. You know, I had a whole bunch of teenagers not able to squat. I worked on this, I tried that, I tried this, I tried that. And then finally I came up and named the goblet squat. You know, I invented that. Uh, I was working with my throwers and I hated the rotation work we're doing. It was just ripping up their lower, their 
cramps in their lower back, hamstring pulls from the cramps in the lower back. And so, and I don't even remember the whole story how it happened, but I came up with the suitcase carry. I mean, I know the story behind it is when I walked through the O'Hare airport with all my daughter's bags, but how I connected that with superior kicking and striking and throwing activities, I, I, I don't remember fully. But one of the things that you don't see a lot anymore is creative. Uh, the people who r rule that the fitness influencers, very few of them seem very creative to me. They take drugs and they do stupid dietary things and they love showing you pictures of themselves half naked and good for them and good for them. And then one day you hit 35 and no one wants to see your pictures anymore. <laughs> but where's the creativity there? You know, how did that... Uh, I work with these young ladies who are personal trainers for seniors and their uh, seniors are in their eighties and nineties. And these young ladies are 19, 20, 21. And they're already miles ahead of any personal trainer out there because by working with people in their nineties, they've had to completely be creative and rethink and restructure how they help people. It's, it's quite a gift. Uh, I feel like I'm rambling, um, but it's important. If you really want to make money in this world, I think, you know, be creative. You know, think outside the box to be a cliche. I guess I could have been a little bit more creative with that uh, cliche. We've got a question from Michael. I would love to switch careers and start a small kettlebell training studio. However, I often wonder if I'm fit enough to be a coach. What are your thoughts on how fit a personal trainer should look? Boy, that ties into our last question, but you know, Michael, that's a great question. Frankly, I don't give a damn how you look. You know, I always love it when people get on, uh, oh, that coach is fat. Who cares? You know, the coach who just won the Super Bowl is fat. So, who cares? His athletes look pretty good to me. They look pretty fit to me. Who cares what the trainer or the coach looks like? Oh, and I know you're all gonna say this crap about uh, Oh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a cliche fest. And I, I've already said enough cliches today. I avoid cliches like the plague. Okay, two people laugh. The rest of you will get the joke after I say I just made a joke. I don't care how you look as a trainer. Some of the best trainers I know have serious physical issues. Um, my friend Ann, you know, she's, 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 she's deaf and uh, she's, but she's a wonderful trainer. Uh, Bill is is blind. He's a great trainer. I know trainers who have overcome. Some of the best trainers I know have overcome cancer. And I tell you one thing: once you've had, once you've fought down the the terror of cancer, all of a sudden your eyes open up a little bit as a as a coach and trainer. All of a sudden, things change a little bit on how you look at things. So I personally don't care how you look. If you can coach, you can coach. Uh, some people win the DNA draw. They just look better. I, I know this one person, and the person is very frank about it. She goes, you know, my mom never exercised a day in her life, and she looks fabulous. You know, I do exercise, but, you know, I probably don't need it. Well, you know, yay for you. But there's also people watching and listening right now who struggled. Now, yes, it could have been the fact that you took a lot of antibiotics in your youth, you destroyed your butt, gut, uh, your gut biome, and uh, or this happened to you or that. All these things are true. Or you have a condition or you have a thing. Your story will make you a much better trainer, a much better coach than someone. I mean, we all know the story in every sport about how the elite athletes are usually the worst coaches because they never had to fight. They never had to do the struggle. You know, if I'm talking to somebody who played in the NBA who's six, who's seven foot six, you know, and they tell me, you know, the secret is the wrist flick, you know, I mean, I'll listen to him like that's pretty cool. But if you got a guy who's five foot two who plays in the National Basketball Association, basically this tall, and he says, yeah, the secret is the wrist flick, I'm taking notes right away because that person had to overcome a hell of a lot more. Obviously, I would really expect you to have good sleep hygiene. 
of course, I also work with people who are insomniacs, so I understand that. I would love it if you, uh, you know, had a basically a clean diet or an appropriate diet. And there's people who can't do that because of certain afflictions. I'd love it if you could exercise, you know, three days a week in the weight room and walk and do mobility, you know, practically every day. Obviously, there's people who can't do that too. But Michael, the key is this. If you build it, they will come. If you have a welcoming fitness facility that teaches movement, that <laughs> what are my old three standards? This is from a workshop years ago. When somebody asked me the secret to being a good uh, personal trainer, number one is don't make your clients look stupid. And it's the same thing, you know, <laughs> you know I always say embrace the obvious. Uh, that's my number one coaching rule. Embrace the obvious. And don't make me look stupid is the number one thing you need to do as a trainer. To me, that's pretty obvious. Okay. Um, have a handful of exercises that your client can master. From that handful of exercises, push, pull, and squat, lever, carry, or whatever you're going to decide to do, I don't care. Then you have, then you have a few, uh, more advanced movements. You have a few heavier movements based on those five. You have some minor variations. You have some major variations. You start to combine the movements together. You make them more complex. When they get complex, you go back to the basics and simplify it. Um, don't make me look stupid uh, uh, is number one. Number two, since I'm on a roll with this anyway, at some level, you need to have success. Uh, you need to have a positive results. Um, positive results can be anything. Here's my walking chart for the month. As I look at this every day, I'm, I'm supposed to walk 148 miles in a three-month period. I think I did that in a, like the third week or something like that. Um, when I look at this and I keep it up to date and I do what I'm supposed to do and I chart my journey and I fill in the whole month, I breathe out and I say, you know, I'm getting results. I'm getting results. Now, it's, you don't always see it on the scale. Sometimes I see it in the quality of my skin. Weird ones. Uh, people say I've got a little brightness in my eyes. Um, so, number one, don't don't make your clients look stupid. Teach them mastery as soon as you can. Um, you know, I, I used to do this thing. I used to call uh, Old McDonald's. Uh, the, the Old McDonald's had a farm formula. E-I-E-I-O. Excellence is obvious. Excellence is obvious. Excellence is obvious. E-I-E-I-O. Get it? It's a little joke. Um, when people walk into your gym and they see people moving well, even they've never even seen them move, they, you can see it with your eye. So first, don't let people look stupid. Two, results at some level. And three, of course, you got to have community. And that is the key to my home gym. I call it my intentional community. That's the key to my inner circle, um, you know, of which I've mentioned several times already. Uh, join up now. <laughs> But the idea on all of this is that if people don't look, don't feel like they look stupid, they're getting results and they have a feeling like they belong, you'll be the best trainer in the world. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question, Michael, and I, and I really appreciate it. And I, and I know I might have gone all over the place, but that was a that made me happy. These these are things I haven't taught in 12, 15 years. And uh, it's funny how it all came back to me because of the quality of that question. So thank you very much. Uh, Sabeg has a question. I'm an MMA fighter that specializes in striking. I am using perpetual easy strength on a long-term basis and enjoying the, ba uh, the, the benefits. Boy, that I, right there, you're a smart young man. So you're a fighter who uses easy strength to stay strong, and then you get on the mat and you fight. It's brilliant. It's brilliant because I agree with you. However, I am not someone who has grappled from a young age. People who have grappled their whole life have an immense bear hug squeeze strength that they use to dominate their opponents in the stand-up clinch position of, of a fight and in pinning positions on the ground. 
I feel this is a weak area for me. Are you able to prescribe an exercise or protocol, perhaps a daily protocol, which I can incorporate into my easy strength training to develop, to develop this relentless bear hug squeeze type strength? Well, <laughs> well, and we're going to have to end this because this is going to be a long one. But uh, first off, easy strength. You can do those five exercises. Um, I'm going to give you a prescription, okay? I want you to do uh, a vertical press, a vertical pull, pull ups, uh, a deadlift variation, the ab roll out, and power curls or cheat curls. Um, so that's uh, those are curls where you do, it's almost like a power curl, you add a little hip to it. So a vertical push, uh, uh, military press, pull up, deadlift, cheat curl, ab roll out. Two sets of five on each. There's your workout. Now, there's your easy strength for the rest of your life. What I'd like you to start doing is also adding loaded carries as a transition to the grappling. So you're going to need two pieces of equipment. You're going to need a bag. Now, I go over to these stores here and I buy Playground Sand. Now, from the spelling of your name, I don't know if, I think I might have to use kilos, but so here in the United States, we can get playground sand. I used to recommend rock salt or uh, water conditioners, uh, salt. But the problem is when the bag rips, the salt ruins the soil. Uh, and if it's on your lawn, you'll never fix it. You'll never clean up that hole, uh, as I know from experience. Uh, I also tried pieces of metal. I've tried rocks. They're all, they're all, they're all terrible. The upside of playground sand is it's clean sand, A. And if you do drop the bag accidentally, yeah, sand gets everywhere for a few days. But long term, if you drop it on your lawn, it actually makes that area of the lawn over time actually look better. My front lawn, I <laughs> whenever I break a, a, one of my bags, I just kind of carry it out there and I, and I sprinkle it on all the spots that need more love. Um, they're 50 pound bags, so I think probably internationally they're probably 20 to 25 kilos or something like that. Um, one bag in a bag, uh, you can put it inside of a gym bag or a backpack if you're just using one bag. If you're using two, you'll need a little bit longer of a bag. Here in the States, you'll see the basketball teams have them. They're a little bit long, they're strapped. And, but if you decide to go three, you'll need a canvas, a heavy canvas bag, which we call like a field pack here in the United States. The other thing I'd like you to have is a heavy dumbbell or a heavy kettlebell. And what I'd like you to start doing is, so you'll pick up, and I would just start with the, the, a single bag day one, pick it up and carry it. Now, obviously the 50 pounds isn't gonna be very uh, hard on you at first. Bear hug it bear hug it and walk with it. Get used to doing that a little bit and then take the heavy kettlebell or the dumbbell and do suitcase carries and walk with it. If it's really heavy, now I've had females use 85 pounds, 40 kilos with this. So you can go fairly heavy with this, but once you feel yourself starting to topple over, that's too much. You want to make sure you stay tall and walk. The next question, of course, is I don't have a place I can walk with the weights. You can march in place. And remember, the slower you march in place, the harder it is. And I recommend stopping with your, uh, you know, one with one foot on the ground, knee high. Try to stop, switch feet, stop, switch feet, stop. It's great for your balance, but it's also going to make the whole system, all the wiring have to bind you up to, to stay in place. I would say that would be, there's, there's a good one workout. Uh, after that, you want to move up to two bags and carry. Uh, ideally, I'd love to see you use three. Uh, you don't give me a body weight here. But once you're carrying your opponent around, now the nice thing about using separate bags, so don't open up the sandbag and pour it in. Keep the bag separate because, <laughs> and this is, this is a, I hate this when I do this, but if I have a sandbag, a second sandbag, and a third sandbag, when I carry it, the load starts to slide down, but this one, the top one, starts to flop around. And every step you take, sometimes, well, most of the time, it begins to kind of flop around. It wants to go forward. So you're getting all this extra work in on each and every step 
without having to spend anything extra. So I'm gonna to recommend to you bear hug carries, suitcase carries. And if you're looking for something to do in between, this might make a nice medley, bear crawl. Now, don't lose your mind. Don't go online and become a bear crawl certified expert. I've talked to many bears in my life and none of them recognize those certifications. But if you do a bear hug carry and then like bear crawl back to where you started, suitcase carry uh, left hand, pick your bear, your bear hug thing back, bear crawl back, suitcase carry right, and just kind of play around with that for a few loops. Uh, pretty sick. Now we call this anaconda strength, where we're from that squeeze strength that you need as a thrower to hold everything together. But I think it's it's would be pretty good for uh, uh, fighters too. Um, try to go, try to vary every workout. Try to vary the load as appropriate as best you can. I would love it if you would vary the loads every workout, the time, the distance every workout, the sequence of how you do it every workout. But I realized that there, I didn't really give you enough options to, you know, make this an infinite thing. But just play around with time, distance, and load. And just get a little bit creative. And let's see if that helps. I'd like you to get back with me if it does work. And if it doesn't, let's blame somebody else. Hey, listen. Uh, these were great questions today. <laughs> they really were. Uh, one of them fired me up, that whole thing about that step up thing, but uh, this was good. Uh, and I appreciate that. If you have questions, you can send them to me at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I love the questions. Uh, sometimes like today, today's episode, I just felt like every single question was something I would answer, you know, like in, in the real life, in real time. So I really appreciate that. And Boy, we had, a, we had some interesting stuff come up, so thank you. Um, I'll be back next week, and as always, until then, let's all keep on lifting and learning. Thank you. Oh, 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 oh.